Welcome everyone. I'm Jeffrey Goodman, Director of Marketing and Development for the YMCA of Northwest Louisiana. And we're here today for Shreveport Bossier, my city, my community, my home. And we have an absolutely fascinating guest today. It is Demetrius Norman. So Demetrius, thanks for joining us. Hey, I'm glad I could be here. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. All right. So um, we're going to we're going to jump into your world. Um, you're a native of Shreveport and graduate of Grambling State University with a BS in electronic engineering technology. You've worked in IT for over a decade with experience in building automation system design, energy management, solar engineering, Internet of Things, cloud management, and you currently serve as a technical consultant in the IT industry. That's correct. I'm so excited to talk to you today because you bring such experience, perspective, and breadth of knowledge to the table. So let's start here. You serve as president and board chair for NWLA Makerspace, a nonprofit organization that gives the community access to tools otherwise too large or expensive for personal ownership. This allows the creative of our community to create, learn, start businesses, or train for jobs using these tools. For those just starting to hear about Makerspace, can you help explain what it is and why it's important? Okay, absolutely. Uh, it's Well, Makerspaces are often difficult to explain because depending on what city or state you visit one in, they usually take on the shape of that particular community. Uh, most of them that have survived and grown and are thriving are mostly 501c3. Um, the creative space is something that's really best served by a entity that's not profit driven uh, because so much of ideation and developing ideas, creating things that haven't existed, a lot of that is a lossy process. So if you were trying to track that uh, in the accounting system, it, it might look like a very unproductive thing until you know you finally come up with that iteration that is the next big thing i mean and i think artists experience that i think engineers experience that i think graphic designers um music artists i think everybody kind of has that moment where you're just kind of going through the motions you know putting in effort um trying to figure out things networking with people and then one day you just kind of like all that work just comes together in this big uh, thing that you create and then that usually defines your career right but people generally they don't see all the loss that goes into becoming a I think any type of professional goes through that right people don't see all the times where it didn't work or you know something caught on fire you blew something up hopefully you lived <laughs> right uh, but yeah when you get to the professional side of things people just see you like clockwork just knowing how to make that painting or you know, build a computer, write a computer program. And they're like, wow, this guy's amazing. He must be born with this skill. Well, no, somebody had to develop that talent, right? Um, somebody had to invest in it. And usually a lot of people, um, you know, our schools generally are, you know, if not 501c3, they're the closest thing to it as government entities. But these are publicly funded institutions, right? Um, very socialist-like. Uh, everybody can have access regardless of their income. You can go to a school. You can go to a public library. So these public institutions are really what um, develop the leaders of our capitalist system. right? But it, it doesn't start with your mom and dad have to pay for you to go to the best school. You can go to one of our free schools and they will develop you into this professional. right? Um, now I will say at schools, they used to have things like wood shops. Right. Where you would have access to some tools. They had home ec, you know, you would get like some very entry level skills to things you were probably going to go to college or trade school and do after school. And in our communities um, before in full scale industrialization and before outsourcing of uh, factory jobs, a lot of people that had these manufacturing and these creative skills, they were people in our neighborhoods. So usually a neighbor working on cars that we don't allow people to do that anymore. But. Um, I can say that there weren't people working on cars in Queensboro, you wouldn't have a Demetrius, right? Because that's where I started learning some of my first hands-on skills, right? Was just going to someone publicly, a neighbor who had tools, who let me borrow tools to work on my first car that was used, that I worked on. I got parts from pipes you pull it, 
right? I had to network with people to learn how to work on the car. Um, and so that was kind of culturally, that's really what a makerspace is. Uh, networking with other people at different skill levels that have the same goal as you. Um, having access to maybe somebody that has bigger, more expensive tools than you. They're a little bit more advanced, but you just want to change the brakes on your car. Um, that person can usually guide you to do that very quickly, whereas you may struggle, waste a lot of time out of your life trying to invent a way to do it. And there's thousands of people that have already figured out what you're trying to do. So all we did was formalize it into a nonprofit and just pull people together um, that normally wouldn't work together. Um, the other thing about makerspaces is that they tend to be multidisciplined. So there's no such thing as like a technology makerspace or artist makerspace or a woodworker makerspace. Um, makerspace is more of a PC corporate term. Um, we know about cultural appropriation, but it's actually a hacker space, right? It's just makerspace is way easier to get corporations to put their name on. But um, I'm sure you know the history of the hackers, uh, like the MIT students that they would use their technical knowledge to solve some social issue. They would have little intellectual pranks where they would build things and, you know, put them on top of trophy cases in the student hall to kind of show off their technical talent. And that's become a trademark of MIT is um, what's called a hack or a project that you put together with the particular knowledge that you have. And it was never discipline specific. So, if, you know, if you were a biology student, it was going to take on that shape. If you were an electrical engineering student, it was probably going to be something with resistors and electrical components. Um, you know, fast forward, um, the hackers, as they went into industry, these were a lot of the students that actually reverse engineered the first industrial sized computers. And they started a movement to make the, the microcomputer, which is very close to like the smartphones that we have today. Right, they're an example of microcomputers. Another example of microcomputers are, you know, these microphones that we're using, podcasting equipment, uh, music studio equipment that a lot of uh, music artists use now, a lot of the cameras. These things are a lot cheaper um, than they were decades ago when you had to be someone of means who had a lot more money to move into industry. Um, a lot of the home studio equipment that people started buying in the 80s it was made with the same computer technology as the first PCs. So hip hop, modern day music, you know, uh, the synthesizers, um, everything that we kind of take for granted now, it came out of these kind of community movements, right? To share knowledge with the general public, build things that solve the need for the community. Um, it wasn't so much corporate driven. It was just people who had a passion for their craft and wanted to solve problems in the world with it. So um, your first makerspaces were actually specifically called hackerspaces, like C-Base over in Europe, right? And um, they were kind of community hangouts, like a rec, like a spa would be close to that, like Parks and Rec. We would all go meet up there and go play basketball. Um, at a hackerspace, people would meet up and they would learn how to work on radios and computers and you know, build things out of wood, like furniture for your home. Um, and you, it kind of be like hanging out with somebody at AutoZone, talking about working on a car. But like I say, it just wasn't so discipline specific. You know, if, if your toaster oven would work, you would meet up at a hackerspace, you work on your toaster oven together and you learn how the inside of it works and you'd have a working toaster oven when you went home. On top of that, you'd have a, a an employable skill. Right. So this is a very informal thing that the hacker slash makerspace community has been trying to formalize. Like, how do we formalize and structure this kind of tribal knowledge that humans have just kind of done organically from culture to culture? Um, and as we know about, you know, Afrocentric and indigenous cultures, I mean, that's how we learned hands on project based learning. Um, peer to peer learning. Um, these are kind of the things that are coded into the program. And what's made NWLA Makerspace or Northwest Louisiana Makerspace so unique is um, instead of having such a strong middle, upper middle class focus where people have to pay $200 a month memberships and where 
you know, trying to operate like a fitness gym and, you know, and charging all kind of premiums and add-ons where basically if you got a lot of money, you can come to a makerspace. A lot of them kind of went that way nationally. Um, there's not a lot of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, and so a lot of the makerspaces throughout the country that have been successful, they're struggling with a thing called equity, with making it where someone who works at a dollar store or, you know, um, a fast food place can't afford to actually be a part of that same type of program. Most of them struggle with that because they have a more capitalistic approach. A lot of them have even tried to become uh, for-profit businesses, which those are the ones like Tech Shop that went out of business, right? Um, and before they went out of business, the owners were quoted saying that um, they found that their best space was actually doing consulting with nonprofit makerspace because that was the best model for ideation in this type of idea, uh, being able to tap into NSF grants, uh, community development grants. Um, those things go specifically through a 501c3. So you kind of close yourself out, off from those opportunities um, when you go strictly a for-profit route. What you can do is go like, a, we've taken on the shape of an incubator where um, a lot of small micro entities, people starting their first LLC have been able to utilize our space. And that's, that's basically a lot of business incubators, people don't know, are also 501c3s where it's a nonprofit serving for-profits, but specifically people who are trying to form uh, LLC entities that don't have capacity. So I think that speaks very strongly to Shreveport and our needs because I think we have a lot more entrepreneurs than maybe bigger cities where people don't really have the capacity and the means to walk into a bank, walk out with a million dollars and buy all this equipment that you need. I think we have the skills, the talent and the know-how here, but we don't have the capacity. So Makerspace, in a nutshell, our goal is to um, democratize technology and creative resources. We want to make sure that there's no barrier for anyone, regardless of income, um, ethnicity, gender, um, whatever type of discriminatory uh, factors that have blocked people from access to capital and capacity. We study that as part of our needs assessment before we formed the organization, um, as we've grown and started to scale the organization. So we have kind of shifted our model a little bit to adapt to the people that we want to serve um, and the people that we feel that we need to serve. So we've had our biggest success and our biggest growth as we shifted more to low to moderate income because, you know, no newsflash, uh, most of Shreveport is low to moderate income, right? So, you know, if we talk about what's going to be the best move to grow Shreveport, we need upward um, social mobility for a very large number of people. Uh, and so we started looking at ways that we could achieve that um, census data. Um, Shreveport has about one third or about 30, a little over 30 percent of the population uh, that does not have a computer in the home. We started taking people's e-waste. Some of our more well-to-do citizens have more electronics and computers than they need. That's a global problem. That's a national problem. But we also had that problem here in Shreveport. So we're doing, we started doing our part in the pandemic when a lot of people had to go to school from home, work from home. Um, give us your e-waste so it doesn't end up in a landfill or in our environment, um, leaching all kinds of toxic chemicals into the air and water, contributing to climate change. Give us that stuff. And not only will we make sure that it gets properly recycled with our partner CRAC out of Baton Rouge, but we will refurbish and restore as much of that as we can, um, the computers that are usable. Um, we've done over about 600 computers that we've um, restored them and given them to people on government assistance, right? So that's not something that, there's a few makerspaces that do that throughout the country, but that's not the norm. So that's something that we're actually leading in the nation of makers. There's an organization that started under the Obama Foundation where he wanted all of us to work together to kind of solve these social issues. So we've kind of emerged, you know, we won an award from Nation of Makers in 2019 for the most innovative um, People's Choice Award. Um, most of the veteran organizations liked the way that we were starting because we were starting our organization doing things that they are now trying to shift and move back to, right? So we've seen a lot of big organizations bigger than us watch programs that we were running here in Shreveport 
and actually reach out to us, email us, get on Zoom calls. And these big, huge organizations in Florida, Ohio, and places around the country, they've started to model their programs that they're doing in their cities off of what we're doing here in Treeport. And as in addition to that, they've also connected us with resources, sponsors, companies. Uh, we've got we've enjoyed the support of companies like AT and T, uh, Verizon, um, the Baird Foundation is a wonderful foundation. Po empowers a lot of efforts here in the area, um, and even the city of Shreveport, after years um, under the uh, Perkins administration, finally got behind the work that we were doing um, at the direction of people like Adrian Perkins. Miss Bonnie Moore, um, and we were able to get some of those CNC machines that we're able to do some job training with, right? So um, we've real been big on we've been really big on digital inclusion. So focusing on skills that people need in their homes right now that are low to moderate income. So whether if that's basic woodworking skills to fix up your home, um, maybe do some DIY furniture instead of spending a very small paycheck trying to go out and buy brand new things. Uh, but obviously those computer skills, because the workforce and business right now is very technology dominant. And when you have 30% of your city, uh, Bossier is the same way, they have the same statistic. 30% of their citizens don't have computers. So when you don't even have this in your house every day as a reality, but you're applying for a job where they expect you to be very fluent and using computers and thousand dollar phones that you can't afford, right? <laughs> they want you to know how to use those apps and programs. And it's somewhat unfair because someone who has several computers, iPads and phones in the house, like my son, right? They're gonna, it's gonna be natural to them and a lot easier. Whereas a person who uh, doesn't have those types of means um, may barely have a smartphone. Right. If any really hasn't got to use any of these apps and technologies, you throw them on the same job and all of a sudden they have to figure out the same skills. That person is now in a situation where they lack equity and they're trying to keep up with their counterpart at work that really has more access to the same tools. Yeah. I'm going to jump on you just because um, I know I could talk to you for 10 hours. I got other questions. You're fascinating. Okay. So I'm going I'm to move you to the next question if that's all right. Okay, uh, let's, let's get okay. on that. Okay, cool. So um, groups like the NWLA Makerspace and the workshops that they typically provide to the community are a huge asset in building innovation culture, as well as in providing job training for adults in science, technology, engineering, art, and math engagement for children, or STEAM, as a lot of people know it. Uh, my question is for you is, how are we doing in training our technology workforce? Is the size of that population growing locally? Also, talk to me about some of the programs the local schools are offering to teach some of those skills and any other STEAM-based curriculum and efforts locally you'd like to highlight. Okay, cool. I got a few notable ones I'd like to throw at you. Um, but yeah, I'll just say in a nutshell to be direct and concise. <laughs> you don't have to be. I just said what it have a Well, lot yeah, to yeah. With. But I want to I want to make sure to drive it home so I don't I don't lose anybody on that rambling. Uh, we are not. We are not increasing the number of people with technology skills in Shreveport. I would challenge anyone after this interview to uh, go to your next school board meeting, go to your next city council meeting or um, cattle parish commission meeting and ask them as a citizen, write your name on the card and ask them what is their overall technology plan for Shreveport. And I guarantee you, they do not have one. Um, a lot back when mayor Adrian Perkins was trying to kind of use his platform as a mayor to make that the conversation of the day, uh, it became over politicized. So people who saw themselves as opponents of Adrian became anti-technology also. And because it's um, it's like a chicken or egg problem, right? You need tech people to get the tech culture in your city. But you, in order to get the tech companies and the tech people, you got to have the jobs and opportunities. So tech people tend to go to cities that already have other tech people. So it's a difficult challenge for any community to shift from being very non-tech to very tech overnight. Uh, I think Lafayette, Louisiana is a great example of how we could do it since they're in Louisiana. 
Um, Tyler's making very great strides, right? Um, but overall, we don't have a strategic plan to do it. And so we have a desire. I don't think there's any professional or any leader in Shreveport that doesn't desire to grow our capacity in terms of people that have the tech skills. Um, but the problem is you have leaders that they haven't made that change in their own personal life. So, you know, if we were going to make a movement to teach financial literacy, would we, would we depend on leaders who weren't fiscally responsible themselves to teach that? Because if you haven't educated yourself in that way, how could you know how to give that to your citizens that you're leading? Um, so, I mean, one of the first place we would really need to start would be some committees being formed, some actual, um, like our elected officials, our local business leaders, they actually need some workshops and some classes leading by example, educating themselves, bringing in technology professionals to educate them on what are the maybe key factors. Like we're not going to be leading the industry in AI next year in Shreveport, but how could we maybe increase some of these remote job opportunities? How could we make some more IT technicians? You know, um, we're already doing HVAC at our commercial buildings. How can we make some more um, trade school graduates, high school graduates that can work on building automation? Um, they may not know all the deep technical stuff, but there's a literacy level that we can start at. So, um, and that's why we've been an advocate for digital literacy. And we're, I mean, just on a positive note, where are some of the high points of STEAM education happening locally, if anywhere? I mean, Southern University in Shreveport, Louisiana. Um, they are, they have stepped up to the forefront now. They don't get the marketing and exposure as the non HBCU counterparts. Um, but Southern has had a lot of accredited, strongly accredited programs for a number of years that are very competitive with some of the other institutions. And they're great, the other colleges locally, but Southern, because it is an HBCU, a lot of times gets overlooked for, um, you know, the role that they played in training our technical talent. So right now they actually have a um, newly created uh, engineering department, an engineering program in the Jackson building. So they have uh, programs and they actually, I was by there the other day, Dr. Kenny Moses, if nobody knows him, he has a PhD in engineering. His thesis was actually on maker, maker spaces and micro manufacturing. So um, if you haven't had him on your show, he could kind of give you some of this vision that we have for transforming our local economy. What about younger? What about middle school, high school? Um, He's doing or... dual enrollment with the high school. So that's the first ever dual enrollment engineering program is under Dr. Kenny Moses at Southern. So you could sign Huntington, Bird. You could sign these students up, Captain Shreve, to be in dual enrollment in engineering, not just electrical, but they got like solar, mechanical, computer. Um, and of course, they got a great computer science program. They have a contract with a very well-known tech company to teach app development right now. Um, so they have an app development program for high school and for adults. And I have those contacts and information. Everybody reached out to me. Now, we started two STEM magnets. We started our first one at Huntington High School in 2018 with to Lawrence Graham and then the uh, Dr. Mitchell from Fair Park came and took over. We've had a great relationship and uh, we had a great relationship with them uh, so far and we've been able to set up. They have engineering at Huntington. Um, they have robotics. They have um, A plus computer certification, computer repair. Um, we were able to sit down and structure all of those classes. The school actually gets credit. Louisiana schools, they get credit for trade credentials that students earn in the STEM disciplines. So if they're doing Adobe Photoshop, if they're doing robotics, computers, whatever, if you can get them a certificate like on Coursera or something, um, they send that to the district person. They count that towards the school's performance. And in Louisiana, it's ranked the same as test scores and as um, standardized tests. So that's a game changer for some of those hot button issues around our schools we could actually turn some of these performance numbers around um, just by getting these kids uh, credentials they can go to work with. So that's been going on at Huntington for, Huntington for a few years. Huntington has one of the top games in the state, has been awarded. Um, they were on the D school list prior to that magnet. And it wasn't just because of our efforts. 
They have amazing principals, amazing staff, amazing teachers, and amazing alumni. Uh, you know, like uh, my friend over at Orlando's is actually has the um, the alumni chapter to help us start it. Now, Green Oaks is our newest STEM magnet. They actually have a classroom and a lab room. Y'all got to go by there one day. It's dedicated to STEM. So it's going to be, it's like a maker space at the high school level. And same game plan. We've already started setting up these, this digital literacy that I'm telling we don't have. We started coding that into the curriculum at Huntington and at Green Oaks. So this was in direct response to the schools being closed, people arguing at the school board meetings. Um, we actually pulled something positive out of that. We got professors from Louisiana Tech and Grambling to come help teach the classes and train the teachers. Um, we have provided in-kind uh, teacher training and professional development. So whatever technology stuff that was a hindrance with the teacher in the classroom, we're kind of that tech support for that educator and for that principal. So we're actually helping them kind of carve it out and catching them in their bumper heads. So to go back to like what you said earlier, the person that's trying to teach financial literacy that's not financially literate themselves, you're you're filling in that gap on the technology side for these teachers. Yes. Uh, it, Northwest Louisiana Makerspace specifically, specifically targets 18 and up so that we can fill that gap that's left by K-12 STEM programs. Once people age out, we're capturing those people that are not going directly into college or directly into a trade, um, engaging them through hands-on means and then pushing them back into our workforce. So some of them do become teachers that teach them. Some of our makerspace um, clients, if you want to call them that, um, that we're coaching and teaching tech skills are going teaching at Booker T, teaching at Huntington, saying, I've worked with Northwest Louisiana Makerspace. I want to teach STEM. And these are people who are non-technical, may have a background in social work or uh, a business major or something non-technical that after we work with them, they become very confident, very strong in like basic tech skills. And they're going into the schools wanting to be specialized in STEM. We definitely want to make more technology capable, technology literate adults, because instead of us just doing maybe a fun robotics day with a bunch of kids, there's so many kids in Treeport that need STEM, that need technology education. You're not gonna do it with like five or six bougie engineers talking about, you know, the awesome salaries we make in companies we work for. That's a capitalist approach. It's got to be a more socialistic approach where we give the means of production to the regular people, the citizens here. They don't have to be an engineer. They don't have to be a tech person. We'll train them whatever skills we they don't have. And then that non-tech person will go back and teach tech classes and teach them to the kids. That's our, that's our model. Love it. Okay, so I'm going to pull some quotes from you. Um, in describing Makerspace, you once said, we are just as passionate about our true impact on the community beyond just cool technology and crafts, but in our efforts to help underserved communities achieve upward mobility through skill-building workshops and classes, maker fairs, micro-business startup services, consulting and teacher training for K-12 through schools, and so much more. Talk to me about how important it is to you that Makerspace serve our entire community. Well, um, yeah, um, and just, if I haven't made people uncomfortable enough, uh, I'm, I'm a textbook socialist, so <laughs> I'm, I really feel like, you know, my contribution at the end of my life will be what I gave to other people and how I empower other people, not necessarily my name or my popularity or my brand, um, my brand has kind of become what I do for everyone. And so that's uh, I'm a very militant, very pro-black person. But people are often surprised to see how many non-black people that I know and that I work with and that I've helped uh, in Shreveport. Because I don't think that loving me means hating someone else. That's, that's an example of socialism. Capitalism is very scarcity. So it's like the black people or the white people or the Latino people. And like socialists are thinking um, everybody should eat, everybody should have equity, everybody should have the same tractor and the same farmland, right? You know, uh, free land, free tools. So, I mean, for me, that's kind of what makes me get out of bed in the morning. If there's somebody that doesn't have equity, doesn't have access to a good quality of life, 
health care, um, the means to feed their family and their household. Um, to me, I feel like my degree in technology is more to solve that problem, not necessarily for me to play with cool gadgets and show off all this tech stuff that I know that other people don't know. Um, people that know me know I'm actually a very humble person and um, I'm not really more of a, I'm really, I'm really not a tech bro. Right. You know, like I know about AI and all the advancements and stuff that are going on. Um, but when I'm learning about a new technology, the first thing I want to know, like at Gremlin State, my senior research project, the first thing our professors told us was, and it was actually part of the project, how is your technology that you're developing for senior research going to solve some world problem? So they challenge us to think like that. Don't just be a person who wants to get a high paying job and be famous and be in magazines, but you've helped no one, right? Um, I was a member of National Society of Black Engineers. Um, we, the east side of Ruston, and we go to like low income neighborhoods, like where we come from, knock on doors and we talk to families. We pass out college information, talk to them about the programs. We would do like these digital literacy workshops for uh, senior citizens and people on assistance. So um, that, like all of my friends that I graduated from engineering uh, with at Gramlin State, like when we meet up now, you know, as alumni, we all are talking about like our social impact. We don't sit there, we don't talk about salaries. We, um, you know, it's not to say that we don't go out, we don't have fun or buy nice things, um, but we tend to focus more on you know, what we came together for, you know, um, I have friends in the Caribbean that, you know, their goal at Gramlin was to educate themselves so they could go back and uplift people in Trinidad and Jamaica and Haiti, you know, in different countries in West Africa. Um, those are a lot of my college friends. So we would talk about that every day as we're doing the work. And as we're in class, a lot of my friends were foreign exchange students who came from countries that could really benefit from what they're doing. And so they kind of had a mindset that I need to do the best I can on my grades. I need to do the best I can at my career so I can feed people that I care about. So every day that I wake up, I'm thinking, how am I serving a larger number of people, right? And so even, I'm more of an introvert, contrary to popular belief, right? But what makes me even socialize or even want to come do the interview with you, if I close myself off from people, then all of these wonderful things I want to do for the community, it's hard to get the message out. It's hard to model this type of behavior for other professionals. If they don't meet a professional like me that's not overly capitalistic, that's successful, a high earner, but that's not what makes me tick at the end of the day. Um, and a lot of people that I've coached and mentored to upward mobility, they are people that I could tell you that 100% of the people that participate with our organization they are involved with other nonprofits. They are, our, me and all my board members, we all volunteer with other groups when we get time out of work and run the organization. But, um, you know, you're going to see people associated with our group. They're going to be at city council meetings. They're going to be at school events. They're going to be volunteering at a school, you know, uh, reading to kids in a disadvantaged community. Um, we like that more than we like the tech or the craft talent. Because we can teach that. I can teach a skill. Um, I can't teach you to be a good human being as much as I would like to. People that are selfish and greedy and don't care about others. It's very hard to build and to grow things with them. I don't know if you've ever been in a work environment with overly capitalistic people. You know, if you get accolades at work, they're sneering and they're not cheering for you because that was supposed to be my award. That was supposed to be my honor. And you're not getting the work done because you're, you're fighting over attention. You're fighting over a raise. You're not fighting over um, maybe the people that your department serves. Uh, so I tend to work a lot better with people that um, care about others and care about all. Right. And so it's very hard to be a person that cares about others, that helps others. If you are biased, if you feel like, you know, women can't do the same work as men, I can tell you that there would not be a Northwest Louisiana makerspace without the women of Shreveport. Um, there, Demetrius would not have a degree in engineering technology. Um, none of this would be the things that we've done without the women that support the work that we do. Um, and even with the computers that we've made accessible to all people to sign up to, 
90% of the people who have taken the initiative to fill out our application and request a computer spend African-American women, uh, mostly with children, right? Um, and a lot of them, they're asking about help with getting jobs. They're asking about help with resumes. They're asking for help applying for college. A lot of them have enrolled in Southern, right? So they're really taking that initiative regardless of what means they have. They're working hard. If somebody says that people on government assistance are just drawing food stamps and not trying to work, I have not seen it. Because out of that 90%, out of that over 600 computers we've given out, every one of those people that showed up for a computer, they want to work. They want their kids in STEM. Um, they are looking for jobs. They are a couple of the recipients started their own business making T-shirts. One of our friends, Tyranny, that runs uh, the STEM magnet over at Green Oak, she actually gave away her old cricket machine to one of the ladies we gave a computer to. Uh, this lady signed up and started showing up at all our maker fairs selling merchandise that she was doing with our computer and with Tyranny's uh, cricket machine, right? And she was able to save her stimulus check, um, do things for our daughter she wasn't able to do. Like, she was very tearful. Um, I believe, I remember the story she told us about being related to um, the kid, Minion, who lost his life at Green Oaks. It's about to go to the league. And so um, that school was very broke up and devastated about that. Um, every time I go to Green Oaks, I'm thinking about those young men that have lost their lives in that community. And, you know, even when you look on the news and all you're seeing is a shooting, um, I'm constantly thinking about changing that narrative for everybody. So white people can feel safe, black people. Um, you, If you look through our pictures, you're going to see people that are not white or black uh, that feel just as comfortable with us because we're not um, kind of culturally close in. Like I think Louisiana surprisingly seems to be at times where we just focus on white and black, but we have a large Latino community. Uh, we have a growing Asian community where they have needs just like everybody else. And I don't think they're being met. I'm going to stop you there. Cause um, that kind of gets me to my next question. And it was a nice segue. So uh, you're extremely involved in the city and uh, in my opinion, unusually articulate about some of the challenges you see us facing as a community. I'm, I'm going to pull another quote uh, of yours, you once said the following, how do you bring somebody from Silicon Valley and say, live in Louisiana and go to segregated schools and go to segregated restaurants, right? And don't speak about social issues that other places talk about openly and work through these things. It makes certain people upset, so just act like it's not happening. This above quote is from several years ago. So my question is, from, from your perspective, are we making progress in the areas you bring up above? Um, that's a good question. Um, I try to be fair to Shreveport. I love Shreveport. I love Louisiana. Um, you know, and my critique is always, I never criticize something that I'm not able to help solve. So I'll never criticize somebody for not having a job unless I'm willing to make calls and send emails and letters of support for them. Um, I think it's disingenuous to criticize things we don't help with. And I think a lot of people do that. And I think at times when I get frustrated about what Shreveport isn't, um, it can kind of distort, you know, the love that I have for what Shreveport is. And I think it's a loving community at the end of the day. Um, and I think there's always been an intent to work across race barriers, to work across genders, as much as there's been fascism and discrimination in our city and our state, I think there's always been people willing to risk their lives and their livelihood to try to fight against that. And I think we're in a much better place. As millennials, I think we can be a little bit spoiled sometimes because we ride on the efforts of Gen X. And, you know, a lot of people, you know, we talk about baby boomers, but a lot of them were getting sprayed with hoses, white and black, for us to be able to criticize things like we're doing now without being beaten with clubs. That's not to say that injustice doesn't exist now, but I think the fact that we even have an expectation for some of the things we want right now, whereas a long time ago, I couldn't even eat at a restaurant downtown or go see a movie downtown. You know, I can go hang out at the Robinson with white and black people now and people of all ethnicities and genders, and it's not an issue. I will say that we are very stagnant it, if we're just talking about, if we were in a meeting with, with the business leaders, how can we grow the economy in Shreveport? 
Um, if you look at all of your top cities, um, rise of the creative class is something that we framed our organization around very heavily. Uh, Richard Florida, um, he, he actually ranks all of your top performing cities in the United States. Majority of them are tech cities. Uh, and not just tech cities, wherever you see a technology city thriving, you're going to see a thriving arts center. Um, you're going to see a lot of social justice and nonprofit organizations. And you're going to see um, a cross pollination of the same people working across all of those. These people are very much makers, even though you may not hear the word, but these are multidisciplined people who also care about the world. That's the maker in a nutshell. Right. So you have people that are maybe working at a tech company, doing art as part of their own brand outside of work, volunteering at schools and volunteering at STEM programs. And that's really been the secret sauce of areas like Austin or even like in Atlanta. You know, um, diversity, equity and inclusion is not like this nasty medicine that people don't want to take. Right. You don't want to use people's pronouns and you don't want to have to stop using slurs that you use at the office. Well, yeah, think about it. you're alienating yourself from potential customers, potential business deals. Think about the buying power, even if you don't care about people in your heart. If you're going to be a greedy capitalist, you could be a good one by being more diverse and inclusive. Right. Because if majority of your customer base is uh, maybe non-white you definitely want to tell your your message to non-white people because they're keeping your lights on. They're helping contribute to your wealth. Um, you're even soliciting votes for to run for office, run them a lot of times. And I just don't think we really do that type of thing well in Louisiana. Um, because of the dynamics, we were one of those states that uh, was very much at the forefront of slavery, Jim Crow, um, gerrymandering, um, some of the most atrocious um, parts of our society has become part of our our state's brand. And there are a lot of people who, regardless of how much they admit that those things are bad, will say that, well, those things were a long time ago. And it's not happening now, and it's just an excuse. Well, all of the wealth that's been built point to a corporation or a wealthy family that isn't living off of slave money. I mean, if that was your capital, humans, right, then your capitalism is built on exploiting people. And so we really don't like being challenged to go against our traditional values. Um, you know, it's it feels like an attack. It's not just white people, it's black people. Um, we very much have the same ideologies as white people because our culture was stripped away. So a lot of times, even though there's like a white black dynamic going on in the media, um, a lot of black people simply want to enjoy the same capitalistic comforts as a white person. Um, they simply want to sit in a white man's seat. They don't necessarily want to stop bombing third world countries. They don't necessarily want to help the poor. And that's a division and a battle we kind of have within the black community because so many of us disproportionately have known poverty, anti-assimilations like myself. Um, we tend to be a little bit more socially conscious. We're helping people whether they're black or not. And black capitalists tend to, um, e even the so-called black activists, um, they tend to have a lot of the same motives and desires as, you know, your most conservative, most right-wing white men. Um, they align when it comes to money. And so, you know, I try not to get too frustrated with Louisiana because I understand that racism drives the money here still, right? As long as the wealthiest person in town that controls key business decisions, that influences laws, policies, the budgets that go to different institutions. Um, that's why racism is institutional. That's why sexism is institutional, anti-LGBTQ. Um, until you change leadership and the leaders don't have those types of bias, um, that type of bias is going to be, you know, reflected throughout their employees that listen to them, uh, their students that are taught by them. You know, if you're being fed um, financially, um, literally fed like the food system, like if you're being fed by people that discriminate, you're naturally going to discriminate against people. Even if you don't have that in your heart and you're not a bad person. I think a lot of us as men, um, we struggle with women's rights issues because we're, we're not a woman. We can't directly relate to what a woman is going through. 
And so a lot of times what we'll hear, well, it seems like all these women hate men. Um, well, it's not that they hate all men. They hate men that violate their rights, that fire them if they refuse advances at work. Right. They hate having to go to work. They're scared that they're going to be sexually harassed and that they're going to lose their job if they don't conform to what's going on with the boys club. Right. What they want is the same thing that a man wants, and that's peace, security, equity. And a lot of times we just need to listen and um, we'll be quiet while other people are talking in Shreveport. But when it comes to listening empathically like listening to understand, active listening, a lot of times mentally we're closed off to what anybody is saying that doesn't have our same um, household values that we were raised with, right? And so if you grow up in a household that's very fascist, very sexist, very discriminatory, in your mind, you're just being like dad. You're just being like mom. And what's wrong with being like dad? What's, my dad was a good dad, right? It's, it's very hard for somebody to distance themselves from somebody that raised them. Um, but the reality is, and I think a lot of us are seeing that as millennials, um, that's the case. You can love somebody and not share their ideologies. As difficult as that is and as much that can trigger fights, um, I, I don't have to dislike homeless people because, and not saying my parents are like this, but if my parents didn't empathize with homeless people, that doesn't mean I have to be ugly to them. I'm a grown man. I get to make my own decisions. I make my own money. I take care of my house. So if I choose to um, perpetuate these forms of discrimination, if my friends are all sneering because, you know, a trans person wants to be treated as a human being, I don't have to try to fit in with my friends and discriminate against a trans person. I can embrace that person, engage them, um, listen to them. Um, they need the same things that a non-trans person needs, right? They still need help with jobs. Um, they still need, uh, they, they want to learn to build furniture. They want to learn to work on computers, right? Um, they're still a human being, right? And I, I just don't think that we're there as a community. And it's not that our hearts aren't there. When people talk about discrimination and bias, I think a lot of times people get offended. Like, I'm not racist and I'm not sexist and I don't have a problem with gay people and trans. I, I just, I don't want kids seeing them. You know, it's, it's a human being. They're going to go to the grocery store. Your kids are going to see a trans or a gay person. Like, you know, that's, that's an unrealistic expectation for them to, you know, I don't hate you. I just would, I wish you would not exist or not go places that I like. <laughs> it's a very hateful thing. And I don't think it's in their heart they're being hateful, but we know the law, right? Just because I didn't intend to run a stoplight doesn't mean I shouldn't get a ticket. It doesn't mean I'm out of line. I think we can be racist and sexist and biased in different ways um, without necessarily having ill intent in our hearts. But if we're not open-minded to changing how we talk, um, listening to people to understand instead of waiting till somebody else, will get, somebody else gets done talking so I can push my agenda. Like I think if we could grow in that way having civil dialogue I mean, have you seen how we get divided on any social issue in Shreveport? Um, the ice storm the other year became politicized. But there were guys with like big four by four trucks who never made a Facebook post except for if your car stuck, call me. And there were guys driving around in their trucks, getting people to the grocery store, getting people's cars pulled out and unstuck. It's very similar to what we did in Queensboro in 2018. Was that 2018 when we had the tornadoes tear up half of Queensboro? And people talked and people argued, but we got out and I don't have experience cutting down trees, but I had chainsaws, I was cutting trees, I was organizing. I had never organized a disaster effort before. But, you know, when it happened, I walked through the neighborhood with a friend of mine. I went back to my house, I put my son to bed for school, and I went outside and I actually cried for a little bit because I didn't know what to do. Uh, I prayed for a little bit. I cried for a little bit. I had no idea that the stuff I got the award for at the city, if you would have asked me how that was going to go day to day, I had ideas, but I, I didn't, I really wasn't confident that I had a good answer, right? I felt overwhelmed by the problem, but I also felt responsible for it because it's my neighborhood. I'm from there. I grew up with these people. 
Um, you know, I'm a product of that community. I talk about it being from there and it just didn't seem genuine or real for me to ignore that crisis. Right. Even though I wasn't directly affected by it and I stayed down the street in an affluent, much better neighborhood now, I, you know, I felt responsible for it and I went to city council. I had to fight, came off maybe negative to some people, but my critique came with an answer. Right. You know, everything I've talked about in Shreveport that is not happening. I've stepped up and I've tried to make an effort to, to do. You'll even see me. At, I've grown a lot when it comes to women's rights issues. And you'll see me at some of the women's rights protests. I was helping make the signs. Um, I didn't talk about it a lot. I just showed up and just did it um, for years. Um, there were um, some Middle Eastern citizens um, that were concerned about what's happening with Israel and Palestine. And they had the Palestinian Lives Matter movement. I was very much involved, very much made myself aware of the issue, how it pertains to us here in Treeport, how it pertains to African Americans, people of color. Um, there was no self interest in me doing that, other than it was just the right thing to do. And I, God knows, I meet people all throughout our state and all throughout the South that they're like that in their hearts. Um, I think it just breaks down when it comes to the conversations. And the communication, because some of the same people, uh, like not to jump around, but like with the disaster effort, I had the African American Nation of Islam members, a minister, um, uh, I, I had the Nation of Islam working on a house with Black Baptists that normally did not get along and knew of each other from like when they were young, but they had grown apart because of religion. And these guys were working side by side and the first time they had talked to each other. And to see them laughing and getting along, there were white people that had, hadn't been to Queensboro since I've been alive. And they came in tears, donating, um, bringing whatever tools they had. Um, as they were helping out, people that had never talked to each other that live in the same city. Um, as I took a step back, like they were starting to get each other's number, network, become friends some of them are still friends now and that was even more powerful than getting the tree off the house or getting FEMA to come down or you know bumping heads with politicians you know I saw what we could do together when we start working across some of those boundaries that um, divide us so that's that's been the vision that's been uh, leading me and leading the makerspace um, it's very much a social movement as much as it is tech and creative um, so, you know, we tend to partner with, we're an ACLU partner. Um, we're a power coalition partner, Black Voters Matter. We've done get out the vote um, efforts for the past few years. Uh, since we started, we've done, uh, we sponsored the census in 2020 uh, because of the 65 Voting Rights Act. A big part of that is protecting the right to vote by fighting gerrymandering. So we testified, I testified at the state on behalf of our communities in Shreveport and throughout Louisiana to make sure that we have fair lines drawn. We did not. Um, we're one of the most gerrymandered states in the country. Um, Governor Edwards actually vetoed some of the maps that were issued, and his veto was under overturned. And ACLU filed several lawsuits. So um, we've been kind of balancing that along with the tech skills, training the teachers, the workshops. So if you tried to call us, email us, get out to us, and we've been kind of bogged down. That's kind of what all we've been juggling. Um, we're dealing with more discrimination and uh, division than I think our country's had in a long time. I won't say historically, but I think the country was kind of moving a good way. I won't say what happened maybe last presidential term, but <laughs> something definitely happened that kind of reactivated this. We're on this side, we're on that side. And it's divided people in a way that's been counterproductive to our economy moving, running our schools, building up our cities. Uh, but I've seen the solution. I've seen like, I, I've kind of seen like the bad and the good side of that. The solution is get people talking to each other, get people working together. Um, the problem that I still see in that is what you're solving right now by bringing me on the show and having diverse voices is that um, a lot of it happens in the media. Right. Because even if you got people working together across barriers, if you don't see it, it doesn't become real for the community. And so controlling the narrative and controlling the visual aspect 
right? Um, you know, thinking about how it looked seeing white and black people together on the bridge in Selma, right? That visual, you know, seeing people from different religions together. The impact of that was so much bigger than even knowing the history of it. The history of it is huge. But, um, you know, I have a lot more appreciation for how you make people feel now. Because I, I can talk about data and statistics and quote history and policy and bills. All that stuff is important. But um, I think connecting that stuff, being led with our heart and demonstrating to people that we care about their immediate needs. Um, that's probably been our biggest signature of our organization uh, thus far has been the way our organization has made people feel. And it's people that don't necessarily exist in just one demographic. So let's let's talk about a different narrative for a second. Um, you're you're a you're a major advocate and supporter of our community um, in in speaking about Lead Belly and the world famous video game Doom. You once said, "We sell ourselves short on a lot of the talents and the great things we have." Talking about this community. From your perspective, why do we sell ourselves short? Okay, I can uh, answer that pretty quickly. That's another branch of capitalism. So um, intellectual property is defined in the United States Constitution. How you actually own like the footage you guys are making right now. It's your IP. But that's a right of a U.S. citizen. So if you think about a place like Shreveport that has all these different disparities, you think about leg ballot, leg ballot, African American man at a time when we were much further behind with the rights to own property, right? But the person that owns his music is a property owner. He owns physical property, which is outlined in the Constitution. Um, we've had efforts to do like fair housing because there was housing discrimination. A lot of African American farmland was stolen, um, property that would be part of the wealth that makes up the wealth gap right now, right? A lot of it was um, political decisions and um, unfair things that were done to establish industry, right? Um, you think about artists like Sam Cooke, who was murdered not too long after visiting Shreveport and experiencing racial um, discrimination from the police here. Um, our Agent Perkins gave him the award the other year. Uh, a lot of people don't know that Sam Cooke owned all his music and a lot of those artists that came down, that came out during that era were actually signed to Sam Cooke. He was an intellectual property owner. So when you talk about creatives and you talk about creative artists, engineers, builders, you know, think about the people who have the legal paperwork to own the work and, and, and take a much bigger chunk of the profit and then create jobs for their family and friends. And think about the people who don't own the paperwork process. Right. You don't have legal ownership over the work that you're doing. Someone much richer than you does. And the contracts they're having you sign, sign over everything that you create, everything you figure out, busting your, bur busting your butt, making that work every day. Um, right. Somebody else owns it and is actually building wealth with it. But I understand that, like in Lead Belly's case, but like the Doom creators were were two Caucasian guys, if not more. So how to so talk to me about how that applies in the doom situation or just overall kind of low self-esteem with respect to well, yeah. reporters from, from your perspective. It's a cultural thing. It's a poor city for lack of a better word. It's a poor city. So what, I mean, what are some poor cities you've been to where a lot of people own the things that they create? Poor cities, um, not just here, and Shreveport. Shreveport is going through the same thing that a poor city in an African country or in the Caribbean. Or it's, we're going. Th we're we're in the same position Haiti is in, right? And if you can look beyond race uh, and look behind race, like the economic engine that creates racism, it affects white people very heavily, right? A lot of white people do not have white privilege. And so if there's someone exploiting a large group of black people in town, like wherever you see a poor black community, there's usually going to be a poor white community adjacent to it. Right. And they may not necessarily associate their poverty with racism. But what a lot of people don't realize when they don't study racism or sexism or any of the isms, even religious oppression, 
there's usually an economic component. So um, the reason why, you know, President Obama signed the America Invents Act in 2011 for ownership of intellectual property because of the historic discrimination and lack of equity. Most people, um, even when you get beyond race, it's been like 95% white, 95% of applications to the Patent and Trademark Office um, have been white throughout the history of our country, right? But not only white, but usually somebody who's very wealthy and white. And that's not most white people. So whatever's affecting a large population of black people, that same thing systemically is usually going to be suppressing a large group of white people. And so that's how you get like maybe 70, 80 percent of Shreveport being oppressed, not having legal power, not having accountants that cost a lot of money, not having the capacity to do something like own an idea that comes out of your head. Um, that's something that's not been democratized, the IP process. So that's actually one of our up and coming programs that we've been the most passionate about. Um, we've had great discussions with Southern University in Baton Rouge. Um, they are on the list of law clinics with the American Events Act. Um, I don't know if you're familiar, but mm -hmm. the act actually subsidizes the legal aspect. So they greatly reduce the paperwork filing process by about 75%, um, they provide pro bono legal services. So just how someone on food stamps in a domestic dispute would go to pro bono legal and will get free legal assistance based on their income, that same vehicle exists through America Invents for intellectual property ownership. So that someone on government assistance could very much trademark an idea or some creative media uh, that they produce, right? And the students at Southern, usually you have to have like a person that's passed that particular bar. There's very few lawyers that are actually skilled in intellectual property paperwork, right? Um, your patent lawyers are actually one of the smallest, that's actually your smallest percentage of lawyers. And, you know, you could guess how many of them are people of color <laughs> um, or people that even a working class person could access. So it's not, really a reality depending on your income class talking about owning things that you create it's like talking about buying a big nice house it's a reality for a handful of people depending on your income status the family you come from for some people it's buy a house <laughs> you know some people are struggling to make rent so um Shreveport very creative place a lot of creative people but um, creatives tend to not be rich people. We know a lot of celebrities that we believe are creatives because creatives get paid to do the work that celebrities take credit for, right? When you start doing the research on the music industry, the video game industry, right? Who do you think has capacity? If we want to start a video game company right now, how do you think they will look at me if I said, we need to make sure we're being diverse in the people that come in and program video games? Like you, you looked at the numbers in the industry, right? With um, sexual harassment claims, how women are treated in the game development industry, um, lack of diversity. Um, it's it's a tech discipline, but it, it's not nearly in the same place that maybe a computer company or another IT company would be in. Um, and so that stifles creativity for us a lot. The reason why United States um, has outsourced a lot of creative activity that's leading us in the war right now, right? Is because rather than dealing with our diversity and equity and inclusion issues, we've simply outsourced to countries where people of color and people of different backgrounds already live and work on these things. And then we put markup on it and sell it through an American company, right? Right now that's shifting because of, you know, the cries and the fears of war. You know, most of our microchips come from Taiwan. And so there's a big nuclear standoff over there right now that's really scary I think for everybody especially us next to we're next to a nuke base <laughs> a lot of people don't know here in Shreveport we're next to the nukes so if that pops off you know we're gonna be very famous in the wrong way uh very soon but we're fighting over or potentially about to fight over a country that makes microchips that we could have been manufacturing here had we not made the capitalistic decision to outsource that rather than simply pay people a livable wage 
or hire a woman or a black person. That's how heavy that that subject is. It's the difference between a poor city and a wealthier city, diversity, inclusion, accepting different people, paying livable wages. These are the indicators of a successful city. And not just in America, we can go around the country. If you have high poverty, you're gonna have high crime. Schools are not gonna do that good. Um, the things we think are unique to Shreveport really aren't. And that doesn't change when we start talking about creatives, right? Austin used to be the size of Shreveport a long time ago. But the older, wealthier white people there decided we're gonna invest in not only our colleges, but we're gonna invest in these poor creatives around town. And they became like a startup capital, right? That just became a cool thing to do. Not different from San Francisco, where you just had people with money, um, just like in a conservative area, that chose to put a lot of their dollars into equity type situations. Let's do a social experiment. Let's build a art studio that's run by women. Let's start a tech company run by Asian or Latino people. Let's see what happens. You remember that movie with Eddie Murphy? where they put him in the stock market with a bunch of white guys. and Oh, trading places? Yeah, trading places. Yeah. And they're like, if we give this black man the same exact tools and resources you guys have, he'll outperform you. And he did. Um, but that was, the, that was an influential movie for me um, to see that and see that, you know, if you just give people the same tools like creatives in Shreveport, if you give them access, I guarantee you, if we were to follow up and we were to get, to, get with some lawyers in Shreveport, who wanted to support the America Invents Act or the pro bono program, or we would uh, get with the new law program at Southern that's being directed under Southern and Baton Rouge. I guarantee you, if you if you visit Southern and Baton Rouge, you'll see people from low income communities that have trademarks and patents that are doing tech startups, that are doing game development, that are doing all these things that we want to do. But you're not really going to make it happen if you're trying to be overly capitalistic and have a handful of white guys have a bunch of creative people that are diverse sign predatory contracts where um, majority of the IP is owned by the white dudes that didn't invent the stuff. And then, you know, we watch TV and we idolize tech bros that are the CEO of a company for, and not to diss anybody, but like a, a lot of times people are being, um, are being looked at as creatives. We're teaching kids about, um, rich people that are creatives who actually did not create the IP that they own. But because our system allows you to buy people's ideas, you can have a great idea, and if you don't have the money to make it, I can simply just mess over you in a, in a predatory contract, take your idea, and now I legally own it. I get to go on TV, I get to go on talk shows, and I get to show off your work, right? I get to have somebody that's not you, like an Elvis Presley, perform an African-American person song, I get to have the Beatles perform Led Belly's music. And if you don't know, right, that that vehicle takes off and feeds other households, but then, you know, Led Belly's family members have to make do without. So, I mean, that is, I think, a real discussion and some action items we need to put together for Shreveport. And there needs to be, it needs to be not overly capitalistic. Um, people that are struggling financially do not want to be just be on television um, or just be on a magazine cover. They would like to feed their kids. <laughs> they would like to hire their cousins that are struggling. Um, they would like to have access to healthcare. They would like to not struggle while they're making this art that we ooh and ah at when we're walking down, when, when we're walking through downtown. So, you know, I think a real equity conversation is how do we put them in ownership where they have documentation and legal ownership of all the stuff they're creating they'll create a lot of their own jobs they'll add to the tax base capitalists as much as they hate socialism will love it because you have a bigger tax base you have more people uh, they'll have more discretionary income after they pay their bills they'll come to your restaurant they'll come to your car lot they'll buy houses it'll be great right like bernie sanders talks about saving capitalism so the best way to save it is with more of a socialistic approach towards um, giving means and access to creatives in Shreveport. Um, that's also why we haven't really moved on it, because anytime you start talking about sharing resources 
with people that don't have it, that big S word comes out. People that are not just on the conservative side, a lot of moderate Democrats have the same ideologies as Republicans. People don't know that. And so a lot of times those will be the people who will shoot those efforts down because if you already have money, why are you interested in a political policy that gives money to people you normally hire to do minimum wage jobs? Why would you want them going to make 30 and 40 an hour? Why would you want them owning their own business and their own brand if you profit from it? Um, so that's there's a conflict of interest there in the room with leadership, and we need to not ignore it or overlook it when we're at community meetings, when we're at town hall meetings. The discussion of the day needs to become democratizing resources, um, making sure people can own the land, um, own the means to grow food, create their ideas, ownership. That's kind of a key, you know, concept to make sure. Okay, so it's all super fascinating. I just could get you to... So we're down to my final question, which is going to put us in this on a, a, not that some of this hadn't been on a positive note, but we're going to stay positive at the end, um, or maybe. Uh, what are, what are, my question is, what are some of the things in our community that make you optimistic as you look around and optimistic about our future? Oh, wow. Uh, so many things. Um, really learning a lot of our rich history. There's always that aha moment when you're wondering how is it we're going to figure this out? And then when you look at history with that same open mind that you need to talk to other people with, um, there's been some very horrible things that have happened throughout history, but there was always some roads that grew through the concrete. That happened in Louisiana. That happened in Shreveport. Um, that happened a lot. It's, it's not always the popular story. Right. But just knowing that there are people that made a way, there are a lot of wildly successful people that come from Shreveport. Um, they don't always come back here and settle because of all the stuff we talked about. And they won't even always waste time to talk about it because they're somewhere where they where people do these things and they're comfortable. And if people here don't want to hear those things, they just go. Um, but the fact that they were able to accomplish it and be from here, um, you know, the fact that I've succeeded doing things around the country and I can work remote, which is the only reason that I've been able to be here uh, as long as I have. Um, that's something that makes me very optimistic about Shreveport. Through the internet, if we can close this tech divide, um, I don't know if you've seen the numbers for like diversity and equity on things like Etsy shop, where people are living in places that um, there's not a lot of equity and pay. There's a huge pay gap for women and people of color, but they're supplementing that gap selling crafts and products they're selling on Etsy. So the online market is huge. Your customer base is not just tied to your neighbor down the street that may also be struggling. Um, you could very much be in a struggling town creating some product that solves a need in Dallas or in Houston or in Austin. You can have a customer base in Austin without physically being in Austin. And by the time you actually travel to Austin, you've made money off of Austin that pays for your trip to Austin. Then you meet people in person, in person, face to face. Now you are getting all the traditional benefit of socializing there, but you're not necessarily having to buy property there, um, get priced out of the housing market there, struggle to be there. You can take advantage of what's going on there without necessarily suffering the bad. And I think that's a perfect historical opportunity to grow an area like Shreveport when we have all these successful people that don't live here anymore, that don't want to live here anymore, but we talk to them every day and see them online on social media, there's an opportunity to connect them to businesses, to brands, to um, uh, maybe a sort of digitized version of Shreveport that we could build here. I think we have the brains, the institution, the technical know how to do it. And I think among Southern University and Shreveport, LSU Shreveport, Centenary, you know, Pipsy, our local institutions. And I, I think if we really had an all hands on deck push, like some of these community efforts I've led, I think if um, we could do that with some of these industry problems, some of these kind of big problems that seem unsolvable, um, I think we have a huge opportunity to make, to make Shreveport the place we've already wanted to be. I think we're both further away from and closer to it at the same time. It's really just a decision right now. 
So we just really have to choose Shreveport. And we really have to choose peace. We really have to choose inclusion. Um, we have to choose to be one city, not a city divided. And we have to choose to put the best interests and the needs of our community over our personal interests and our personal grievances uh, with people. So um, that's the opportunity I see right now. Um, it's just us sitting down, people that never talk to each other, talking and connecting our resources, making the conversation real, us following up next week, having lunch, and boom, we're over at Green Oaks building that up. And boom, we're over on the other side of town meeting with some tech people and some creatives. Uh, that's what I see right now, and that's what's getting me real excited about. As stuff is kind of breaking and collapsing and falling apart, as a builder and a maker and a creative, I see all kind of scrap stuff that I can pick up and build something newer and better with. Uh, so that's that's really my vision for Shreveport now. I can't top that, so I think we should... We should end on that note, unless there's something else you wanna you wanna mention. That was that was beautiful, and I couldn't say it. There's no way I could ever say it better. So, okay, cool. Well, I'm glad to come by. I'm happy to visit in the future or follow up. Let you know what we've done in response to this conversation that we've had. Because I hate to have these great long dialogues and not something tangible come out of it. So I definitely have some things planned and some things I'm already that are already in motion. Um, that connect with what we've talked about today. So um, we can kind of focus more on specifics instead of the deep conceptual stuff I like to talk about. Um, I like going from the deep conceptual in the clouds to let's walk over here and see what that looks like. So that'll be like our next dialogue. Sounds perfect. And I definitely want to stay in touch and continue following. I mean, it's hard to follow you because you're doing so many great things, but I want to continue yeah. to be aware and uh, stay informed on yeah. what, what you're into. I'm going to support your platform, definitely share with all my contacts and followers, and uh, you know we'll work together. I'm going to try to support you as much as you've supported me. Thank you. Appreciate you. All right.